grew up, or I didn't grow up in church, but I started attending church when I was about 18. And there was this common theme. On Mother's Day, they did a really good job of honoring the moms and preaching a very honoring and uplifting message. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. On Father's Day, <laughs> they did a good job of honoring the dads with a gift. And a really good job of stomping on their feet. Right. <laughs> and so this year I was kind of impressed with uh, radical reverence because it was a little bit more of a stomp on your feet kind of message, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I would love to tell you that I would change the culture, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so when Pastor first asked me to preach today, I was really excited because I thought, man, what a great opportunity to dig into some of the things that you always hear me talk about. Yeah. Some of those key principle things like godly celebrations. I thought, man, I can really dig into that and we can talk about it, right? Yeah. Pre-decisions. Praying with and for and over your kids. <laughs> I'm sure you heard that a second ago. <laughs> and ensuring a consistent message from home in the church. Yeah. And so I was thinking about those and, and just really thinking, man, what a great opportunity to try to drive those points home, really teach them. And God reminded me of a recent conversation I'd had with a guy at work. He came to me several weeks ago and he says, Mark, I got baptized last week. And ever since then, my life has been living hell. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of walked him through what happened to Jesus yeah. when Jesus got baptized. And then the next week, we were scanning a truck and I walked into the, the, the bat of the truck and I said, how's it going? And he said, man, I'm trying so hard not to drink. I'm trying so hard not to do this. And I'm trying so hard not to do this. And he listed off three or four things. Yeah. And there were three or four things that he was specifically challenged with. And I said, man, I need you to understand something for me. Chasing Jesus is never about what you're not doing. Chasing Jesus is being a Christian is all about trying to please your daddy. And when you focus on him... Really dig into your word. Really do this and really do this, right? These things, if you really do these things, then that stuff, you won't think about it. It won't be as hard not to do those things. But when you're focused on not doing something, you're never going to win this battle. Right. Amen. And so <clears throat> I told him Christianity isn't a list of don'ts. Yeah. And God told me, Father, here it is more than a list of do's. That's what he spoke in my spirit. And so if you're not a father today, I want to tell you this message is also for you. Amen. Can we celebrate with just one second a clap of the hands for all the future fathers? Amen. Um, my mom was the only good father I ever really knew. She had to play both roles. That's just... One of those things. So there's not a person this word does not apply to. Amen. I promise you. Amen. And so the Lord began to speak to me through my story. He began to show me how I came to believe some of the things that I've believed throughout the, the history of my life about what fatherhood was. Yeah. And I want to take you through some of those experiences that have shaped me and transformed me. So, that to begin with, I have three sermon titles, and unlike Pastor, <laughs> who tells you he has three sermon titles and he gives you one, throughout this word, you're going to get all three of them, okay? So, the first one is All Things. My first sermon title is All Things, because this is a Romans 8.28 message. Amen. And it says, Romans 8.28 says, 8, says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Yes. So I'm going to start by telling you about one of the scariest days of my life. Me and Jamie had decided that we wanted to have our first child. Some of you who were here yesterday got to meet Joshua. Yeah. And so we'd been trying for about six months. And for a 20-year-old, I need you to understand something that's very important. Trying to have a baby and being a dad had nothing to do with each other.
I grew up in a household where we could barely afford, we could all, we always had food, but we never had those extras. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, but there was always Briar's ice cream in the freezer and little Debbie snack cakes and candy, but they didn't belong to the family. They belonged to him. And he was not a very good man. And honestly, neither am I. And so as I look back, and, and so based on those experiences, I had decided that I was not going to be that guy. Amen. That I was going to do three things. That if I could fix three things, that would make me a good father. I worked all the time, and it wasn't because I wanted to be rich and have a bunch of money. It wasn't because I needed to be successful at work. It was because my security was wrapped in making sure I could provide for my family. Yeah. My identity would have been zero if I wasn't providing for my family. Mm. The second one is I did not want to be the most selfish human being on the face of the earth. That was my second thing. That's what was going to make me a good dad. So I was going to be a provider, and I wasn't going to be just the most selfish human being on the face of the earth. And the third thing is I was going to be present and engaged with my kids. I was going to spend time with them doing things. Those were the three things that, in my opinion, would have made me a good father. And so... And then as an adult, now that I look back, I realized that my stepdad had a list. And his list only had one item on it. And it was not to leave. Not to leave. Not to abandon his family. Because that's what his dad did to him. And see, what happens is we perpetuate bad behavior because we don't have a true identity. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long here thereafter. O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to the children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. So when you sit in your house, you're supposed to talk about loving the Lord. And when you walk by the way, so when you're walking with your children, you're supposed to talk about loving the Lord. And when you lie down, so when you lie down, you're supposed to talk with your children about loving the Lord. And when you rise and when you get out of bed, you're supposed to talk with your children about loving the Lord. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Today, I believe God only desires one thing from humanity. From each and every one of us. He only wants one thing. You want to be a good dad? You want to be a good mom? 
a good employee, a good boss, a good husband, a good wife. You fill in the blank. You, you decide what that thing is. And I can tell you this one thing will accomplish that goal for you. Do this one thing. Chase him with your whole heart. Amen. Yes. Be in constant pursuit of his presence and his will. Yeah. Yes. yes. Or my second sermon title. Be a God chaser. Amen. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to outline what becoming a God chaser really looks like. And so a year ago, or even a couple of months ago, if you had asked me what a good father was, is I would have given you a list. It would have been a lot different than the one I had when I first became a dad, but I would have given you a list mm -hmm. of what qualities make up a good father. And if you turn on the TV today, you will find tons of sermon that will give men a list of five things, yeah. ten things, of what makes a good father. They'll give you a list of things that you do to become a good father. Right. And I want to challenge you in that thought process this morning. My word of the year is perspective. Yeah. And over this year, God has really given me a lot of perspectives. And today, so probably in the last three months or so, God has really changed. And there's been this constant message that has been just ringing in me. And it's chase me, chase me, just chase me. Amen. And the reason for that is because I was challenged to read a book. And I read the book, and then I was challenged as a part, because in case you don't know this, your pastor doesn't ask you to do anything he hasn't already done. Right. He doesn't challenge you or bring anything up here that he hasn't already experienced. So he went through this book, and I knew he was going through it, so I asked if I could join. And so at the end of it, he decided that he was going to do a 40-day fast, so I decided I was going to join him in that too. And because of your leadership, I'm a different man today than I was before. Because of your leadership, I am a better dad and a better chaser of God. And I want to thank you for that. But he is also going to give all of you the opportunity to do the same thing. And right now I'm going to ask him to come up and introduce that to you guys. So I knew I, knew I was going to have a part to get up here and speak, but I didn't know when it was coming. So <laughs> um, it, This actually just goes along with what I kind of announced last week. Um, anybody here last week, anybody that was here last week, remember what I announced that we were going to start? Um, well, home groups, but it's also, it's really just a group, okay? It's really just, and what I, I kind of uh, gave it a name over the last week or so, um, and we're calling it RadFam. RadFam. Huh? Yeah, Rad Group. RadFam. Um, what this is, basically. I wasn't in the loop. Um, so, just going to be real, because that's what I do. That's, if you guys don't know what Rad stands for. Rad stands for real, authentic, and different. And that is one of the ways that I try to be, do dadhood different. I try to do my, just do life different than the world. And that is being real, authentic, and different. And so just being real, um, and I don't know where I was going to go with that, actually, now. Um, I think I was going to give you the beginning of Rad, but... Um, I'm not going to do that because that, that would take forever to explain and everything. But um, the 40-day fast. We, so we went through the book Radical. That's the book that he was talking about. Um, the book Radical by David Platt. Um, that is a book that will change your life. Like he said, it changed my life. It changed my family's life. Um, it made me a better, just like what he said, chaser after God. Uh, because that's what the whole book is about. It's radically chasing after God. Because, you know, that's what Jesus tells you to do, right? right. Yes. That's, what Jesus, that's what Jesus wants us to do, right? Yeah. Um, and so, at the end of reading that book, um, there's this, uh, this experiment, this radical commitment that you make, basically. And in that radical commitment, um, God spoke to me and told me that we needed to do a 40-day fast. So we fasted from social media. I fasted from some food things and, and stuff. And... Um, God really spoke in the middle of that fast and said, you need to start a group for people that want to do 
this radical chasing after God. They, if they, for people that want more, people that want more that are like just kind of bored with just normal church, normal mundane, everyday church, um, and people that just want to dig in and just radically chase after him. And so that's what he laid on my heart. That's the motivation and the inspiration for starting this rad fam, this rad group. Um, and this is going to be open to more than just life fellowship. Because I believe there's more people than life fellowship that want to ch radically chase after God. Yeah. Right? And if we ever want to like get more people for the kingdom, then we got to reach outside of this little kingdom. Ugh, I could preach a whole message on that. But anyway, he only gave me a certain amount of time. So um, Rad Group, Rad Fam, that's what it is. Um, and we're actually, just to give you guys an idea of what we're going to do, we're actually going to go through the book Radical. We're actually going to lead you through the book Radical. So because it changed my life so much, changed my wife's life so much, it's changing our family's life so much. I know it changed Mark and his family. I know it will do the same for you. Anybody want a change? Anybody want something radically changed in your family? Amen. Okay, then this group is for you. Anybody want more of Jesus, Amen. like in a different kind of way? Amen. This group is for you. So um, we're still working on the date. It's not going to be this week like we thought it was going to be. Um, so probably next week. Next Thursday. next Thursday is what we're looking at, the 30th. So just put that on your calendars, mark it, and keep a mental note and... Um, we'll let you know if anything changes on that, but I'm excited. I'm so excited to get a bunch of people radically chasing after Jesus. Amen. 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 That's all I got, so. <laughs> oh, wait, I do have something else. And if you want to know the beginning of Rad, if you want to know where Rad came from and how we got to where, where Rad is and the start of the group and everything, we actually have a podcast that we started. And we will be going into detail about the beginning of Rad, where it came from, and all the things on the podcast. So you guys, a little plug for the podcast. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> so today I'm going to give you three tools, okay? Three tools that will help you in the God chasing process. And that was the first one. Rad Groups is the first tool that you can use, that you can put in your tool belt, that will help you. But I'm also going to cover six principles this morning about how to become a God chaser. Amen. The first principle of becoming a God chaser is real relationship and relationships. Amen. So real relationship and relationships. You will never trust someone you don't know. You will never depend on someone you have a casual relationship with. It's true. Yeah. So let me tell you another story, and it's actually the scariest day of my life. And so, it's the day my second child was born. I discovered through this um, sermon that all but one of my kids' births brought me a lot of trauma. <laughs> Micah was the exception to the rule. Uh, but the day Kaylee was born, we had... I had changed jobs, so we were living in Alma, and Jamie's doctor was up there in Fort Smith, and that's where we were living, and we had moved back to Mayflower. So when Jamie thought she was in labor, we moved at such a point where it was really hard to find a different doctor. So we actually had to drive to Fort Smith when we thought she was having the baby. And we got there, and the doctor's like, yeah, you are, but it's going to be a while. And he said, but I don't want you driving home. So they admitted us in the hospital, and so just the normal activities, and we were sitting there just kind of hanging out. And then they put the, the monitors on and all of those things, and then slowly but surely, I started watching the monitor, and the heart rate would go down, and then it would come back up. And so then her mom and her sister were in there with us, and they began to notice. We asked the nurse, and she said, don't worry about it, it's fine. Don't worry about it, it's fine. And so we continued to watch the monitor, and all I could do was sit there and watch as my baby's heart rate went down 
and then it would go back up. Go and ask the nurse again, are you sure this is okay? Yes, it's fine. And then all of a sudden it wasn't fine anymore because eight people rushed into our room and they had my wife doing every position, flipping over, turning over, doing everything they possibly could to get that baby out as fast as humanly possible. And my daughter was born not breathing. And the doctor was in such a hurry to get her to the table that he yanked Kaylee out, and when he turned around, he dropped her. He caught her right before she hit the floor. And I, they began to do CPR on my, on my baby. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit took me, and he said, Mark, you can't do anything about that, but you can do something about this. And he turned me around. that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, I, I had a relationship, but it was kind of more of a casual relationship. So in that moment, because I had the Holy Spirit, I had access to his peace. But the next day, I had to depend on my faith, and I hadn't built that. So the next day, as we began to go through this, fear set in. And I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I had weak prayers. I had weak faith. I prayed itty bitty prayers. And prayed for God to heal my daughter. I prayed for God to let her breathe. I didn't pray that she would have a normal life. I prayed that she would have a quality of life. And all those things are okay. But I serve a great big God. But because I didn't really know that he was a great big God. And because I was crying out to someone I barely knew. That I didn't have a deep, profound relationship with. I was feeling like I was calling my uncle who happened to be rich when my car was broken down and I needed some money. Ooh. One more time. Husband and wife. Husband and wife. Right? Yes. Okay. Who wants their daughters and sons, when they grow up, not only to have a spouse that loves them, but they want their, them to be number one in that household, the single most important person? Who wants that for their kids? Absolutely. Let me tell you one of the key things you can do to make sure that happens. Are you ready? I'm going to drop some real wisdom on you. Make sure they're not number one in your household.
marriage was so that the world could look at your relationship and see what a relationship with God was supposed to look like. Amen. That is the purpose for marriage. Amen. The purpose for your marriage specifically is that you were put together because you should be able to serve God better together than you do apart. Amen. Amen. And you see that in this ministry right here. The way they play off each other, the way they cultivate each other, the way God works through them, they are better together. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I know, so they're, they're, when you look at priority, let me explain it to you, okay? So your spouse is number one, right? Yeah. And you together are called to become what? One. 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 And your first priority as one, as a relationship, is your children. Yeah. Amen. That's the way that diagram or that paradigm works. Yeah. That's how that is established. That is how God planned it. Amen. You are each other's number one. And together in your unity, your children are the number one. That's right. That is God's plan. So, I'm going to be honest with you. I could spend the rest of the day right here. On the marriage relationship and what it means. It is a huge, huge deal for me. And we don't have that much time. <laughs> and so I've asked around Valentine's Day if I could come back and talk some more. <laughs> I already asked for permission. <laughs> but before I, I drop that off, let me ask you one more question. Do you want what you got for your kids? When they grow up Amen. and they get married, if their marriage looks like your marriage, will you be happy? Amen. Will you think they married well? Did yeah. they do good? Wow. Yeah. Do you want what you got for your kids? And I'll be honest with you, today, I do. Yeah. I do. I love that woman right there uncontrollably. To the point where pastor catches us making out outside. Okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yes. It really happened. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was gross and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but, so there's not many things I believe I do well. But my marriage is one of those things. Yeah. But to be honest with you, it wasn't always that. I probably used to have one of the worst marriages you've ever seen. I put that woman right there through absolute hell. And I've asked her to come to give this part of our testimony today. Because I want, I don't like portraying myself as that bad of a guy. <laughs> and so I've asked her to come tell some of our story. Okay, I brought notes just in case. I pretty much know our testimony, but, um, you know. <laughs> so, um, how many ladies out there had a list of what their boyfriend or husband should be? Me. It went like this. Christian, blonde hair, blue eyes, hate speak. Respectful, <laughs> loving, but so when I, I know it's a weird request, but God honored it. Just so you know, He hates feet. <laughs> and when I when I met Mark, he had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and he went to his aunt and uncle's church. So he should be a Christian, right? Right. right? Um, so I fell for him and we started dating and, but I was impatient and I asked God, I said, God, I really want to know if he's the one for me. I was only 16 years old. So I asked him to please have Mark say, I love you before Christmas, some form of fashion or way. <laughs> I know I was 16 and God is awesome. He, he just, you know, honor 16 year old request occasionally so um two things you need to know about mark 
is he never says I love you unless he means it and he uh, didn't believe in opening Christmas presents before Christmas Day. So um, on Christmas Eve, he gave me my present, but he told me I couldn't open it until Christmas Day. And so midnight come around and I get up out of my bed <laughs> and I open the, the present and it is a locket. And guess what it says? I love you. Yes, he had a bought me um, that and God honored it, <coughs> answered my prayer, um, a 16 year old prayer, silly prayer, but I tell you all of that because the next part is horrible. It just, you know, I want y'all to see God's faithfulness to his promises. So the honeymoon phase, after we got married, the honeymoon phase lasted a couple of months then the fighting began and it was awful horrible um our first fight was about who was gonna cook the okra <laughs> i wasn't a cook so i wanted him to cook the okra um wait it gets worse i pretty sure this is the fight that it happened i bit his leg no, i bit his leg so hard that he bruised for two months wow yes at least two months anyway so i have to be honest with y'all and so but so it just got worse from there but god is a miracle working god and he loves marriage mm -hmm. um but months and years went by and and we were still fighting <laughs> We were calling each other every name in the book, threatening divorce, getting in front of each other so they could so we couldn't leave. Um, just you name it, we probably did it. I, uh, he almost pushed me through a window, rocking chair and all. Um, one time when I was pregnant with Joshua, he threw a porcelain doll at me and I almost peed my pants. No, wait, I did pee my pants. <laughs> Yes, and so I could go on and on about the horrible things that we put each other through. It was it was horrible. It was it was every day almost, and um, but we we had our priorities screwed up. We didn't know what we were doing, had no idea, and Mark decided one day that he'd had enough, and. We say it was mutual, but it really wasn't. I just went along with it. So I moved in with my parents and I cried a lot. And I began to question God, why? Why is this happening? What is going on? I know you gave me this promise. I know he's supposed to be mine. So why is this happening? Um, so I began to pray over our marriage and pray over him. And if anything, it changed, it started to change who I was. Mm. And so I decided to go to church where we had been going to church. So yes, you can go to church and be totally screwed up and totally involved. <laughs> and, um, and we were secretly going through it all by ourselves, lonely, um, just isolated. It felt like, cause nobody knew our family didn't even know what we were dealing with and um but the, i decided to go to church and face the music marriage life conference ticket a half off because you know if you have to pay for some of it you're more than likely going to go and you're going to invest in it yeah. so i begged mark to go and he said he finally agreed 
and he said, um, I'm going to, but it's just so I can look, because we only had Joshua at the time. And it was just to look Joshua in the eye when he was older to say, I tried everything I could. And that's all, that's the reason I'm going. I'm not doing it for anything else. So when he came and picked me up, I got in the car and he looked at me and he said, don't get your hopes up, you ain't coming home. I cried 45 minutes all the way to the marriage conference. However, um, God is amazing. The first session was pretty unremarkable. There wasn't, I mean, we were listening, um, but we had homework afterwards. Our homework was to answer some questions and to write a love letter. So we got in the car and we started answering the questions and we started um, writing the letter and we missed the next two sessions because God was working. Um, all the resentment, all the hurt was just being washed away. We began, God began to teach us how to be married, how to communicate each to, to, with each other, how to serve each other, and how to love and respect each other. And our marriage was healed that day because of this conference, because of the church that we were going to, because people cared. Was I still fearful? Yes, I was fearful, but I chose. I chose, and it's your choice too. I chose to love, respect, and honor him through the fear until it was gone. And today, things happen like getting caught in the parking lot kissing <laughs> instead of fighting in the parking lot and coming in with a smile on our face. Um, I love him so much. He, I can't imagine doing life without him. And I, because of what happened in our marriage and then because of the marriage conference and allowing God to come in and really work in our marriage. Our marriage is what it is today. And I want everyone to have a godly, amazing marriage like ours. So the second tool to becoming a God chaser, the second tool that I want to tell you about today is a marriage life conference. And he has the dates that hopefully are on the slide. <laughs> That's, we're past that. There we go. There it is. There it is. Okay. And so this is one of the key foundational things that saved our marriage. It created conversation. It created things. So how many of you have changed your oil in the last 12 months in your car? No, paid somebody to change the oil, had the oil changed. So most people, and I, I know you think you're investing in your marriage when you go out to dinner together, but you're not, you're investing in your stomach. <laughs> Ooh. Ouch. <laughs> it's just the truth. True, yeah. Okay, so most of us have spent more money on our cars this year than our, than our the most single, most important relationship. Yeah. It's just true. Yeah. So I challenge you today, to put this on your calendar. It's important Amen. to invest in your marriage. It's important because I promise you, you can't have a right and tight relationship with God if you don't have a right and tight relationship with your wife. You cannot be divided like that. Amen. Your spiritual man will suffer if your relationship at home isn't right. To get this price, you have to register before like August 20th. So just so just so you know, register at least 30 days beforehand. Otherwise it goes up to like $195. But it is a great weekend. It is fun. It you we've been three times and we learn every single time. All right, now that you know I'm a horrible human, we'll continue on. <laughs>
So God chaser number two, the second principle in becoming a God chaser is authenticity. And we've talked about the damage that living two lives with your kids does to them. It's the single worst thing you can do for them. It's to bring them to church and, and have someone explain the values of what we believe here and then take them home and live differently. And the reason that is such a big deal is because when they grow up, are they going to choose rules or freedom? Because those are the only two choices you've given them. Rules or freedom. So I challenge you because what you need, the, the decisions need to be, it's not rules, it's relationship. Amen. You're going to teach them one or the other. You're going to teach them that church and being a Christian is a bunch of rules or being a Christian and chasing God is about relationship. Amen. You're going to teach your kids one or the other. And I challenge you not to, not to divide their life like that. Jesus had I am statements that clearly expressed who he was. He also outlined some in his word for us. If you don't know who you are in Christ, I, I promise you, read Ephesians 1 and 2. Yeah. Amen. And every time it says that you are something, write it down. Because that's who your creator says you are. Amen. If we don't walk in our identity, they will struggle with theirs. I read another study that said fathers are the central figure in helping children form their identity. They believe they are who they are because of who you are. Mm. They believe they are who they are because of the words that you say to them. Yeah. And men, we are the central dominating force in that household. That's right. Every mom can tell you, why did my kids start acting better the minute dad walked in the room? <laughs> True. If you don't believe you have a different authority and a different set of eyes on you than the person sitting next to you, you're wrong. You have a responsibility to be you so they can be them. Amen. Amen. Number three is different. <laughs> different is telling your kids they are, in fact, male or female. Yeah. It's not a choice. They don't get to decide. Amen. Different is telling your kids that his marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's forever. Different is putting self after God and others. Different is looking at God for your identity instead of finding it in the world. Yes. Unfortunately, the next point is we not only have to be different from the world. Different is worshiping him on other days besides Sunday. Amen. Different is getting into his word and his presence daily. Different is putting people before programs and preferences. Amen. Different is living your life in total submission to a holy and a mighty God. Yeah. Amen. And so we've talked about relationship. We've talked about what different means. We've talked about these things. But the great question in every sermon is how do I get from where I'm at to where you're telling me I'm supposed to be? Right. And the problem I have with most sermons is they don't get there. Right? Right? They tell you you're not something, but they don't tell you how to become something. And this isn't, and this is the sermon that this is where it's going to hit the road for you. We are all called to be disciples of Christ. My favorite definition of disciple is disciplined one. Yeah. That is my absolute favorite definition of disciple. A student is someone who learns information. You're not a student. A disciple learns and applies and disciplines his life based on what he's learned. Amen. So what are the spiritual disciplines? And if you Google it right now, you'll get between 3 and 30. <laughs> yeah. Right? 
because everyone has an opinion, right? So on what the spiritual disciplines is. And just to annoy Pastor, I have four. And he's thinking in his head, you could have had three and you could have had seven. Why do you have four? <laughs> The first one could be three additional, so you could get seven there, but. <laughs> the first spiritual discipline is reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on the Word of God. Yeah. Your interaction with the Word of God is the foundation that all, unlocks all other spiritual disciplines. Amen. This is where you start. Amen. And a lot of people would argue that it's prayer. But where do you learn how to pray? Right. From the, Bible. Amen. From the Bible. Where do you learn how to trust the one that you're praying to? Amen. In the Word of God. Yeah. The very first spiritual discipline and the single most important one that you can start today is getting in the Word. You can't trust a God you barely know. You can't stand on a promise you haven't declared. And you can't believe a truth you haven't discovered. When you read the Word of God, you find the promises. You find the person. I know I have some tweetable quotes. <laughs> she told me not to dance. I had to. <laughs> and so, this is tool number three. Everybody in the room who has a smartphone, hold it up for me for just a second. Okay. Okay. Most of you, if not all of you, have the Bible app on your phone, yeah. right? And so the question is, and what people ask me all the time is, where do I start? Start right there. Yeah. If you, there's a button on there that says plans, pick one. Yeah. Yes. Just pick one. Amen. And do that. That's where you start. You want to? This, I'm telling you, it's foundational. You can never ever be good at any other spiritual discipline unless you're good at this one. It doesn't work. So start here. You have it right there at your fingertips. I don't care which plan you pick. Pick a Bible reading plan. The New Testament in four months. Pick a book of the Bible. Pick a one year Bible. And don't get stuck in the day to day mundane part of it. I challenge you to do it. But if you're reading it and got the Holy Spirit says, wow, that's interesting. Spend some time investigating that. If, if, it, if, if it speaks to you differently or there's something about it that, that's different, start reading it. Start investigating it, looking into it. There's a reason the Holy Spirit chose to show you that. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And through that process, you will learn how to study the Word of God. Amen. So the first one's reading, right? Yeah. There you go. You, I gave you the tool to read. Memorizing, I can't even talk about because I'm horrible about it. <laughs> But studying the Word of God is how you get intimate with Him. And you won't do that until the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you about the words you're reading. Right. Amen. So the second spiritual discipline is prayer. If you don't have open communication, you don't have a relationship. It's true in your marriage. Yeah. It's true in your spiritual life. Yeah. It's true with your parents and kids. Yeah. Communication is the key. It's the building blocks, right? Prayer is where that starts. And through this 40-day fast, it's um, probably the number one thing the Holy Spirit challenged me on. And it's not that I don't pray, but my verse of this year is, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Yeah. And so he asked me how he can ever speak if I won't shut up. Oh. Wow. So there is, and I can't explain it to you, and I don't understand it. There is a trick, and I'm working on it or something, about being quiet before the Lord. Yeah. And I would love to tell you I have the answer to that, but I don't. But he couldn't have told me that if I wasn't in prayer to him. Amen. Prayer is the door that unlocks that communication. Yes. Right. And communication is two-way. I understand that. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, and that means you just... 
everywhere you are, he is. Yes. And you never stop talking to him. Amen. Unless he tells you to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Spiritual discipline number three is fasting. Pastor has been saying this for like the last three weeks. The Bible doesn't say if you fast, it says when you fast, right? Yes. right. That's true. Yeah. That's what it says. But how often does Jesus say deny yourself? Mm -hmm. All through the Bible. Yeah. Deny yourself is about denying your flesh something that it wants. Yeah. That's what fasting is. It's denying your flesh something that it wants in order for God to be able to speak into that spot in your life. Amen. That's what fasting is for. It's not to get what you want. Right. There's a group of people that used to say, I'm going to not eat until he answers my prayer. God doesn't do blackmail. That's <laughs> true. Amen. And I promise you, he's more stubborn than you are. <laughs> but it's about giving up something, taking that time and devoting it to God, and through that process. And that's why we say it doesn't have to be food, right? right. For me, food's a really good one because I really like food, right? Mm -hmm. right? But the problem is, is I usually eat on the run, so developing that time to God is really hard for me. So I have to do food because if I'm not eating something, it helps me think about God, right? Because I'm hungry. Or I'm hungry for something specific, right? But I have to also give up like TV or this or that because those are the areas in my life that actually I have time developed to them. Right. And I have to give that time to God. So that, in a nutshell, is, is fasting. It's literally just opening yourself up to say, God, speak to me. Yeah. That's the purpose of fasting. And number four, would have never made a list of mine until I came to this church. And it's fellowship. Number four is fellowship. Fellowship isn't Sunday morning service. Amen. Fellowship is going to the Cooper's house, having a pool party, yeah. talking about God, and having communion. Yeah. That's fellowship. Fellowship is coming to my house and talking about a book we're reading and talking about spiritual disciplines. Fellowship is doing life together. Yeah. Yeah. That's what discipleship is too. Right. It is living life together on purpose for a purpose. Amen. Yes. And I have grown because of the fellowship in this building over the last year exponentially. And I challenge you yeah. to be in fellowship. That's Tuesday nights. That's all the things that we do, but it's also doing things outside of those things. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Right? right? It's more than just showing up to the scheduled services. It's scheduling your life around the people that you want to influence and that you want to influence you. Mm. Yes. Amen. Devotion is the commitment not to allow today's circumstances or challenges to trump yesterday's decisions. Or another way, devotion is saying what I decided is more important than what I'm facing and desiring. Mm. Devotion means that I'm going to do the things that I've decided to do even when it's hard. Yeah. That's what devotion is. It's not always easy to love my wife. <laughs> Most of the time. It's not always easy to love my kids. Yeah. It's really not always easy to read my Bible. Yeah. 
But when you make those decisions, devotion says, hey, I understand you had a really bad day. I understand that your world's falling apart. I understand that your hot water heater blew up. But you made a commitment to get into your word every single day. And your de decision trumps your circumstances. So you may be asking yourself, because I would if I was on the other side of the sermon, how is this a Father's Day sermon? <laughs> right? No, not at all. <laughs> and in my research, as I was doing this, a guy said something that will become one of my essentials for the rest of my life. And I'm going to share it with you in a, in a way that, that what I did with it after he, I heard him say it. So... Caleb a lot of times asked me to come in the backyard. See, we have a trampoline in our backyard. Pretty good size one. And Caleb wants me to come outside. He never asked me to get on the trampoline with him. What does Caleb want me to do when I come outside? Watch him. Wants me to watch him. Micah understands that games that aren't one direction don't work for his dad. I'm not going to look at a map. That's the most frustrating thing in the world to play a game. So if it's not Mario and he doesn't know to go this way, I'm not playing. <laughs> but he consistently asks me to come in the room when he's playing Fortnite. What does he want me to do? Watch him. Watch him. Watch him. Right? So this week I asked both of them why. Why do you want Daddy to watch you? And Caleb said, I want to show you what I can do and impress you. Okay. Micah said, because I want you to be proud of me. Mm -hmm. Here's what I told them. Did you know I want you to watch me follow Jesus? I want you to watch me be a good husband to your mom, yeah. to be a good father. I want you to be proud of me, and I want to impress you. And I didn't mean wow them like Caleb did. But I meant impress upon their hearts and minds what right looks like. On this Father's Day, this day right now, I want to declare before all of you that my sons and daughters will know how to chase Jesus by watching me. Amen. How will they know to study the word? How will they know how to be a good father? How will they know how to be a good husband who loves, honors, respects their mother's authority, who protects her and cherishes her, by watching me. Amen. How will they know how to respond when their world falls apart? How will they know how to stand up and fight for what is right? How will they know how to love others and to give by watching me? Amen. How will I ever possibly be able to live up to this standard? There's only one way, and it's my final sermon title by being a rad dad. Some of you are thinking, well, thank God my kids are grown. I'm not held to that standard. You don't think they're still watching you? 
there's no escape clause for anybody in this room. Because if nothing else, if you never have a child, if you never get married, the Bible calls you to disciple other people. Amen. This message applies to every part of your life. And I assure you, if you do those things, if you just chase him with your entire heart, yes. 